everybody. Uh, we're just going to start with some introductions, leading off with Jason Boyer. Ah, I wasn't prepared for this part. Oh, do you want me to read it? <laughs> this is Jason Boyer. He's the Senior yeah. System Administrator at Equinox Open Library Initiative. Take it away, Jason. Tell somebody about yourself. And uh, for the next uh, two days, I'm the president of the uh, Evergreen uh, Project Board, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, I've been working in libraries for over 20 years and very excited about Evergreen. I think we're going to Okay, Taryn, it's you. <laughs> I'm Taryn McKenna. I'm the Pines Program Manager at Georgia Public Library Service. I've been here for eight years, um, but I have been working in libraries on and off for 35 years. Um, and uh, I um, have been in libraries in four different states. Um, and. Pines in Georgia is one that I'm the most proud of. Um, we have 52 regional library system members around the state with around 300 branches and service locations that we support. We have about 10 million items and 2 million patrons. And we contract with a courier service that moves books from all of those systems uh, to each other around the state to fill holds. Um, Along with my normal Pines duties, I participate in the Evergreen community as much as I can. Um, I coordinate bug squashing week and feedback fest testing activities for the Evergreen community and also the new developers working group. And I've also served on the Evergreen project board and conference committee in previous years. Back to you, Ruth. And it's me. Uh, I'm the support and development administrator at the Indiana State Library, which means zero to people that don't ask me what that actually means. I actually have two roles there right now. So I do training and support for the Evergreen Indiana Library Consortium, which is made up of 128 library systems. Most of them are small, but not, not all of them. And uh, then I also am the coordinator for the Evergreen Community Development Initiative, which uh, we have an exhibit over in, in the expo hall, so you can check that out. Or you can talk to me and ask me what that is. But we do development stuff. I have been with libraries since 2007, and that's a long and storied career. Not always a happy story, but it doesn't matter. And I've been with Evergreen Indiana in some form or fashion since 2008 when my library was one of the pilot libraries for Evergreen Indiana. My spot in the community has also been storied, I guess. Started with me basically complaining a lot and then people being really nice and still <laughs> inviting me in. And here I am today making jokes in this conference session. Uh, and I will say I am a passionate advocate for Evergreen uh, open source ILS and also love this community. So we'll talk some more about that. We're going to start though at the very beginning. And we're gonna go with Taryn telling us how this whole thing got going. Okay, so um, this is a very, very brief um, uh, history of Evergreen and how it got started. Um, the origin of it um, actually starts a few years before the software development actually started. Um, this goes back to Y2K. Um, uh, when Y2K was approaching um, and software uh, was preparing to fail all over the world, um, there were numerous Georgia libraries that uh, had old integrated library system software um, that simply wasn't going to be able to make the transition to, uh, through Y2K. Um, and then there were also a number of Georgia libraries at the time that were still on card catalogs. Um, many of those libraries had, you know, poor local resources um, and just didn't have the funding or the local, um, you know, technical skill set to transition to a, a ILS software. Um, so the state of Georgia 
and Georgia Public Library Service worked together to develop the Pines Consortium with the goal of providing equity of services to the entire population of Georgia, regardless of what their local county resources was. Um, they wanted to be able to, you know, uh, provide materials and share materials between library systems. Um, so initially when Pines was formed, it rolled out on a large commercial ILS that was available at the time, uh, just with the libraries that needed the most to get over that Y2K hump. Um, but then as they started bringing more and more libraries on board, um, it quickly became clear that the commercial ILS they were using simply wasn't scalable enough to be able to handle the size and complexity of the consortium. And there really weren't any other options that were any more scalable um, at the time. So um, around 2004, uh, GPLS um, got funding to contract a small group of software developers, uh, most of whom are still, you know, um, integral to the Evergreen community today and, you know, stuck them in a room and trained them on library procedures and cataloging and policies and all of the things that they would need to know to develop the software, uh, you know, fed them Mountain Dew and bananas and candy bars. And um, then the first version of Evergreen was rolled out in 2006. Um, once that initial contract um, contracted project was completed, that group of developers um, actually stayed together and formed Equinox, which is now Equinox Open Library Initiative, which is where Jason works now. And um, they continue to provide development and support services. Um, now, they are still one of the primary development um, institutions. But since Evergreen was developed as an open source software from the very beginning, there are now a lot of other contributors as well. There are independent companies that are development shops. There are developers that work for uh, library consortiums um, or uh, support companies. And there are individuals, um, you know, like me that just work for a library system and contribute in whatever ways we can. Um, so now the software over the years has, you know, evolved and um, improved. Uh, it started out as a, you know, an installed client version um, that had to be installed on each computer. Um, and we, if you hear the term Zool, X-U-L, um, pronounced Zool like Zool from Ghostbusters, um, then that is refers to the old installed staff client. It was um, transitioned into a web-based staff client over the last um, six or seven years uh, and is now fully web-based um, and has, you know, in incredible improvements being added to it all of the time. It's now uh, being used in different countries, in different languages um, all over the world. Um, and Although, you know, we may not have the largest um, user community compared to, you know, gigantic open source projects, our user community and development community is extremely active and dedicated. So, and that's why we're able to continue uh, making these improvements that we do. And that's the end of my section on the history. Karen, and it, it's just good, an ongoing thing. Uh, in some ways, I miss the old staff client, but the web client is such a major improvement. Yeah, I think that I think all of that is kind of shared <laughs> amongst the community because there are definitely some things that that are missable. But um, yeah, it is a new thing. So a lot of times when we talk about open source anything, there is a conception that it is free. And oftentimes it is, <laughs> it, it, it is that free word that really gets libraries excited and um, not just libraries, librarians, but also people in general. I like the word free too, but it's important to remember that uh, 
open source anything, and in this case, open source library software is free like free puppies. And you're going to be paying for it one way or the other. And it's important to plan for that as you think about um, anything. I mean, I, I, of course, we were talking about Evergreen ILS in this case, but really anything in that case, there are things to consider, things that cost money. So of course there is the hardware to run the stuff, even though it uh, is on the internet, it's a web page that it still means that that needs to be served from somewhere. So there's server uh, things, although your libraries may have less requirements for their um, computer terminals that they're using because it just basically needs to be able to run a sophisticated website. All of that hardware stuff is, has been moved somewhere else and there still is a, a requirement to have stuff that can run that uh, ex extensive software and then serve it up. And then support and development. And uh, Taryn talked a lot about where this started and the ongoing part. And, and Jason has gone from working at a library to working for a consortium and now working in a development and support house and all of those things the people that are there they they have to still pay mortgages and, and eat food and things and so it's so we pay for it and it is also important to keep in mind that while you may have in-house people that can do this and they're getting paid that their time is also something that is a it is a monetized thing because it needs to be a monetized thing because time has value so it is not free in the sense that you are going to get it for free and it's going to work and you're never going to have to do anything about it keep in mind that there is a cost associated with it when people are talking about open source versus proprietary ILS, I usually use this oversimplified thing, this oversimplified phrase that with a proprietary software, you're going to be paying a lot more upfront. And with an open ILS, you're going to be paying potentially the same amount, but you're going to be paying it over time. And so keep that in mind. This is my favorite part. As you can probably tell, I talk a lot. I mean, there are times when I'm silent, but it's not when there are people around. Uh, so the community has been and always will be my favorite thing. The thing that gets me super excited about open source in general, but specifically about the Evergreen ILS community or the Evergreen project, that being the um, the name, which we'll talk about uh, soon. But what does that actually mean? In our community, that means a bunch of things. It includes libraries. And when I say libraries, I, I, I need to just couch that and say librarians, but we'll get to that. Librarians and library consortiums, support and development vendors. There are other stakeholders, and, and Taryn mentioned this as well. There are some uh, very, mm, there are some formal support and development vendors, like actual companies, people who have a shingle out there saying we do this thing. And then there are others who just uh, love the project. I'm going to, I'm going to drop a name in here and some of you are going to recognize right away. And those of you who don't just keep it in the back of your mind. Uh, if you know Ben Shum, he at one point, I mean, in some points, he was in these first two things, libraries and library consortiums, support and development vendors. And he is that now in that other stakeholders where he's got a job doing something else and still loves the Evergreen project and still contributes. And he is not alone in that. I think that it is always important to remember and reiterate that for all of this, for the committees and, and all of that 
it comes back to the committee is made up of people who are invested in this project, uh, whether it be for their jobs a lot of times, but it's not just for their jobs because there are a lot of jobs that people can have and a lot have chosen to be invested in this collaborative thing. So now we have the Evergreen Project. And Jason, because he is in charge for two more days. I know I, I know I said in charge. I know you're not in charge, but I just wanted to see you, you cringe when I said it. Um, is going to tell about project governance and then about the trademark. All right. Yeah, so the Evergreen Project, we probably all know what that is. Yeah. Uh, we're here for a conference about it. <laughs> We've got two, there's a little P evergreen project, which is the ILS that we're gathered here today to celebrate. And also the big P evergreen project, which is a little bit different. Uh, the evergreen project and its board represent the interests of the software, uh, do things like making strategic decisions that aren't necessarily technical um, when necessary haven't been a lot of those around the software itself lately. Uh, we also are in charge of protecting the trademarks with which we are currently working with the SFC. Uh, that'll be changing in the future. Uh, we fundraising and we manage the conference finances and hold the uh, what profit there may be so that there's a buffer to start the next conference the next year. And the board is made up of nine community members, and you absolutely do not have to be a developer to be on the board. Uh, you just have to care a lot about Evergreen and be a visible participant in the community. Uh, and you can learn more about the board and how to keep up with the goings on at uh, evergreen-ils.org slash governance. And I think Ruth wants to talk a little bit more about the conference and uh, my other favorite event, the Hackaway. He said Ruth wants to talk, and I'm just like, people should be discouraging me from talking. But nonetheless, here I am talking more. So the International Conference, you kind of probably have a clue as to what it is because you're at it. Uh, this generally is something that happens face-to-face, uh, -face, but yay COVID, no, not yay COVID. Uh, has changed some things and we did get an opportunity to try some things that opened this up for people who have not been able to participate in the conference in the past. Um, this is one of the main things that the Evergreen Project does apart from all of the, the software and all that, that's the, that's the main thing. I mean, it is a development committee or community, but this is where a lot of the uh, continuing education, the future planning conversations, and let's be real, the relationship building happens at the international conference. I highly encourage you that when we go back to a face-to-face -face conference, that you make this a highlight of your year. I know many of us who have been to several of the conferences uh, know that this is the case, that this is where we get to see one another, have conversations about life, and but also about the direction of the software, what it means in our institutions and all of that. Then Jason mentioned his second favorite. Is it your second or your first favorite? You can't, you don't, I'm not going to put you on the spot and make you make this, a judgment call. This is it. number one. You know okay. That. Well, I didn't know if it's your favorite, but the Hackaway is a time for the developers to get together in the same room and do as, just as it says, Hackaway. And they, they get a lot of things done collaboratively. It generally happens uh, end of October, beginning of November, the, this Upcoming one will be in October. I don't have the exact date uh, in front of my face right now. It's at the end of October. We're hoping and planning for it to be a face-to-face -face hack away at Fort uh, Benjamin Harrison, Fort Harrison. 
in Indianapolis, Indiana, or in Lawrence, Indiana, if you want to be technical about it. Thank you, Keith Koffenberger, October 25th, 27th. And it, it is a great time to, to work together on those things. It has been kind of opening up a little bit to a little bit less of experienced developers recently, uh, but it definitely is a working session, so a working time. And then the other thing that the Evergreen Project does is an annual report to uh, pro provide information and accountability to the community as far as what has been done in the previous year. And this year's annual report, this is often spearheaded by Rogan Hamby with a cadre of people who hopefully listen when he says, I need help. Um, as one of the people that's there, I was like, I, I will proofread it, but I can't guarantee it's great. I can't guarantee that my proofing is great. The inner report is always great. It has stories about what's going on in the community as well as uh, information about major releases and contributors and things like that. It will be available on the last day of the conference. Um, so tomorrow, at the end of the conference tomorrow. Keith says developers plus food equals code. I can't dispute that. The other thing that I want to say is if you have any questions as we're going along here, please throw them into chat. We will answer those uh, as we see them. And since I have it open, it'll be pretty quickly. So the next thing that we want to talk about, and I mean, it's a development community, is about the development. It's a, uh, this is something that I learned from doing, not developing. I have not learned to develop, but how this actually works. And it starts just as basically as you think it would with somebody saying, I wish Evergreen had this. I wish Evergreen did this. What if it could do this? Why doesn't it often do this thing? And then getting uh, somebody else to say, well, that's an interesting idea and having those conversations. And once they get started, then it does get a little nebulous because there is not really a, a codified path for development. It can start right there and it can begin with the submission of a launch pad ticket, which Chan will talk about in just a second. It can um, begin with a technical consultation with either a paid development house or somebody you know in the community that, that knows more than you that can talk to you about, is, is this possible? What would it require? The building of requirements saying, okay, we want this, but what exactly do we want? And when we're talking about computers, that is always a pretty nice thing to do. What exactly do you want the computer to do? Because they do not read minds. They do exactly what they we tell them to do, if we know how to tell them to do it correctly. Community discussion, which can happen in Launchpad, can happen in IRC, can happen at conferences, can happen if you happen to be working in an office with other Evergreen people, it can happen across the table or through Slack or whatever you're using. And then how are you going, how is it going to be funded? Uh, there are several different modes for this as well. So is it something that needs to be funded? Do you have an in-house developer? Are you, is it a big enough project that you need to solicit for partners? Are you participating with something like the ECDI where it pools funds as well as does some project management in there? So there are a lot of different things that go into the before for the project or for the development for Evergreen. So Taryn's going to describe a little bit more about what this is. And it does go a little bit into the weeds, but this is all stuff that, ha that necessarily happens. Yeah. So I just wanted to take a few minutes to just give a very, very simplified version of 
how a bug actually gets fixed, like the workflow, not the code part, but the workflow of how something happens. And this process is, is similar for a new feature as well. So we use um, a tracking system called Launchpad, which is a website, and I have the link to it on the next slide um, that you'll see in a moment. Um, so we use that to track all bug reports and wish list requests. And now this is an open um, site. Anybody can create a Launchpad account. You just need an email address and a password, and you, you can contribute um, bug reports or conversations about bugs, um, testing reports, etc. cetera. Um, so what initially happens is one person identifies a bug. Um, now, instead of just going immediately and submitting it into Launchpad as a bug, um, you know, there's some due diligence that that person should do. They should, you know, check with their co colleagues and make sure it's actually a bug and not something that's a uh, feature. <laughs> and also make sure that it's not something that's just a local configuration issue, that it's actually a, a software bug. Um, and we do have community test servers available um, that have stock Evergreen installed on them with no local customizations. So you can go to those at any time and, you know, check to see if the behavior there is the same as what you're seeing on your local system. Um, so once you're pretty sure that this is really a bug, you can search Launchpad and determine if it's already been reported. And if it has, then you can add heat to it, which is, means you just click on a link that says, does this bug affect you? And that adds a little heat uh, index to it, which um, helps people prioritize which bugs should be looked at first. So once one person submits the bug, another person will confirm the bug and that by doing that it will change the status from new to confirmed and that person should always be at a different organization from the original person because that um, you know helps make sure that there are multiple eyes from different perspectives looking at the problem um, so then once it's confirmed, someone can develop a patch to fix that bug. So a patch is just a little bit of software code or, or a large bit of software code, depending on what the problem is. Um, so, in, so that person can be at one of the reporting or confirming organizations or, the, or some other organization entirely. Uh, when they come up with a patch that they think is going to solve the problem, um, there's a few different steps that they'll go through, which I won't get into here, but they will basically post the patch and add a pull request tag to that bug. Then another person, um, someone who is not at the developer's organization, but at a different organization, again, to keep multiple eyes on it, will install that patch, test it. Um, if it's something complicated, maybe multiple people will test it. And then someone will sign off on it saying that, yes, they've done every bit of testing they can think of and it works great. They add a signed off tag. And I'm mentioning these tags because even if you're just looking at bugs, you can tell by looking at it like how much progress has been made on it. So if you see something that's just still in new status, it doesn't have a pull request on it. That means nobody's done any development work on it in general. Um, and then if it has a signed off tag, it means that someone has both tested and signed off on it. Now, after the sign off, it doesn't automatically go into Evergreen. Uh, a core committer, which is a small group of developers that are very, very intimately familiar with the code, will review that code. And if it passes muster, then they will commit it, which is a, a software um, tracking term. Uh, to the master code repository, which is just the, the core evergreen um, code. And you can tell that they've done this because the status will change from confirmed to fix committed. Um, and at certain point, and Jason will talk a little bit more about the release process, 
um, <laughs> and yes, upon stone it, is it etched. Um, and then it is, uh, so once it's committed into master, you know, anybody can actually, you know, run it uh, if they install it from there, um, but it will get officially packaged into a release. And when that point happens, then it will change the fixed released status. Uh, could you change the next slide, Ruth? Um, I have a few links here um, in the slides um, that you'll be able to access later. Um, oh, first I want to mention I'm doing a more in-depth session on Launchpad tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern. If you want to learn more about just dipping your toes in there, um, even if you just want to look and see what bugs are currently out there, and I'll talk about how to do that and how to, you know, tricks on searching and um, if you want to participate in doing things like adding tags or um, confirming bugs or adding heat to bugs, we'll go through all of that tomorrow. Um, we also um, have several uh, bug squashing weeks and feedback fests throughout the year. Um, Right now, we're kind of on a schedule of doing two bug squashing weeks and two feedback fests per year that come up before a new release happens. Um, there is more information at the link that is on the slide. And what hap the difference there is, you know, testing processes happen every day throughout the whole year. But during bug squashing week and feedback fest, uh, we have a set of volunteers that puts up um, publicly available test servers with the new versions or with bug patches loaded on them so that everyone can test them without having to set up your own test server uh, and you know have that that particular skill set so that really opens it up to testing for a lot of people that um, you know don't have that kind of technical um, specific technical skill set, but that do know the software really well. It gives you a lot of opportunity to part participate. So I greatly encourage uh, everyone to participate in Bug Squashing Week and Feedback Fest. Um, and next slide, please. And the other, these are just some um, links. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about the technical side, um, the evergreen-ils.org, that's the main Evergreen page that has everything. Um, if you want all the documentation, that's all in there. Um, if you go to the downloads page, that has all the release notes. So if you're running, say, 3.6, but you want to see what um, is uh, now available in 3.7, then you can go to the downloads page and read the release notes to learn about the major features. There is also um, a community test server that's always available uh, that has um, that currently has 3.7 on it, so you can go play with it at any time. And the other sites are just uh, information on a you know, more technical side. If you want to go look at the actual code that lives in git.evergreen-ils.org. Uh, and if you want to learn more, more about using Git um, to actually contribute code, there are instructions on setting up Git to connect to the Evergreen server and um, uh, you know, the processes, the step-by-step -step details for how to sign off on a bug and how to submit a bug for uh, testing or a bug patch for texting. Uh, I think that's all the slides I have. I'm going to pop back here real quick for uh, Jason to talk about what then the release process is. All right. The release process I'm discussing won't be significantly uh, informed by this slide, but keep in mind this all happens right before what I'm about to say. To say, do you want me to go to a different slide? No, no, I don't okay. have one specific okay. for this. So, uh, some of you might be wondering on occasion, you know, how many creatures you have to sacrifice and to what eldritch horrors in order to produce a viable evergreen release. Uh, I can happily say that generally the answers are none and whichever you prefer. Although it's possible that uh, sometimes Git might cause you to doubt this wisdom. Uh, the more common way the Evergreen releases are put together, though, is that uh, the developers gather either in IRC, the developer email list, or quite likely this Friday at the Hackfest, and ask for volunteers or nominate someone to be the next release manager. Or, as has been the case recently, a member of a release team. 
and then the release team will take the normal twice a year release cycle and try to schedule uh, milestones around that to make sure that as many fixes and improvements can make it into this new release as possible. Uh, this is done usually by participating in uh, the bug squashing weeks and feedback fests that Taryn mentioned with everyone else and also working with uh, patch authors to determine what might be needed to get a bug that might be stuck uh, over the finish line and in good enough shape to finally make it into the code base and then a release. Uh, you might notice us discussing a list of old bugs now and then. These are things we still want fixed, but something must have happened and uh, the release team can usually try and help people figure out what's going on with those old bugs and get them going or they'll nudge you and you can help. <laughs> and there will be at least one beta release and one release candidate or more if needed. And if things are in good enough shape when testing a fresh install and various upgrade scenarios, the final .o release will be put together and given to the world. Point releases like uh, 3.7.1 come out monthly or thereabouts, depending on the changes committed since the last release, um, but these are much simpler than the full release process because usually only bug fixes uh, get considered for point releases. If you've got some big new feature, you got to wait for the next dot O because we don't want to try and backport some big fancy feature to what otherwise might just be a simple bug fix release and confuse a bunch of people and not give them the opportunity to do training. That's always fun. So that's basically the release process. If you're interested and you're a developer, uh, show up to the HackFest. Maybe you can help out. Also, oh, oh go ahead and introduce oh, me. Yep. And now Jason's going to talk about the next thing. Yes. So <clears throat> I mentioned uh, IRC and the email list and such earlier. But this is, those are the primary ways to stay connected with the whole Evergreen community. Uh, we've got lists for discussing the documentation, acquisitions, cataloging, circulation, and a few other more technical lists are also available. And there's also a great new developers list uh, if you're looking for help getting started with development. I think Taryn is involved a lot with that one. That's a good one to check out. And we also welcome everyone to the Pound Evergreen IRC channel, currently on Freenode, uh, likely soon to be on a different network to be determined in the coming days, which will still probably be most active during the workday in Eastern time. Uh, developer meetings also take place in this IRC channel on the second Tuesday of the month at 3 p.m. Eastern. And you can get more details from these links below. And I think Taryn's going to tell us about interest groups, which you should also be a part of if you haven't looked into them already. Muted, sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so um, if you want to get more involved, um, you know, whether it's in development or testing or just, uh, you know, if you want to get in touch with more people that are in your area of expertise, such as cataloging or acquisitions or reporting or, or things like that. Um, there is a committee or interest group on just about everything. Um, to get a really good introduction or overview of those, um, I suggest that you come to the Ask Not What Evergreen Can Do For You session. Um, that is later today at 3 p.m. Eastern. And um, that'll kind of give a brief overview of all of the different interest groups that are currently available in Evergreen. Um, and, you know, the different, more, more information on the different ways that you can communicate with each other and, you know, um, you know, I, I think the, the, the point that I want to make that I'm not making very well is that um, if even if you are working at a small evergreen library, um, you are not alone. There are ever, other people in your situation dealing with the same problems out there. And uh, these interest groups are a wonderful way to meet those people and learn from each other and, and support each other. You know, they um, cataloging interest group kind of, for example, which is, I, I emphasize because it's such a good group, um, even though I'm not a cataloger, <laughs> it, um, 
you know, it has a really good balance of both talking about new features and testing new features and plans for new features, as well as actually working through existing types of problems and strategies. Um, so, um, and then I mentioned the um, new developers working group earlier, which is the one I started. So I, I'm a big fan of that one. <laughs> but uh, uh, but there's, there's other wonderful ones too. Um, one for, you know, every every special uh, topic. So I think that's all I had. I do uh, also a shout out for the cataloging working group. Um, that is a great toe into the community for um, people who may not be um, even interested necessarily in development, but it, there is a a lot of workflows and training that happen in that that working group and testing of development that's been done, which is a, a super important part of development, actually getting in there and feedback fest and bug squash week have been mentioned, but the cataloging working group also does some testing there as well. And then the new developers workshop is uh, also, I think Taryn mentioned that she started it. I did not start it and I think it's fantastic to get in there and see people pick at things with a lower level of expertise, which is what I have. Um, I have an even lower level of expertise. And so it, it's a great way, honestly, to see people make mistakes and muddle through a and to look at little bite-sized bugs now and then and sometimes fix something, but sometimes just see that the process of learning requires making mistakes and making mistakes is, is a noble thing to do together. So I definitely uh, encourage both of those groups. Uh, I want to go back real quickly. Uh, so there was a question from Deb about, is there a way to, a way or process to request improvements and or new features and not just bugs? It really is exactly the same. Um, so there are little bugs that just need like some, some code fixes and things like that. But if we're talking about some major things, you're still gonna be talking about launch pad tickets. You're still gonna be having discussions in the community. You're still possibly going to be uh, looking for partners and things to say, is this important to you or not? And so it, it is the same process. And I, I definitely encourage, especially people who have not ever been involved in Launchpad to attend the session on that. It is a really cool thing. And I'm going to call out Sarah Childs. I know is in here. She is a, an Evergreen Indiana librarian, and she has been an active participant in Launchpad for uh, many years and is not at the administrative level in our consortium, is not necessarily, at least at this point, uh, really active like on the community committees, but has done a lot of work testing features and providing feedback for the developers as they work on those bugs through Launchpad. So definitely check out that session if you have the opportunity um, to do that. And then there also was a question from Aaron. So is the Evergreen Release Manager picked at the October Hackaway and Jason's response being sometimes the Hackaway and sometimes IRC, but there is usually an email that goes out to make sure that anybody that might be interested has a chance to say they want to do it. One of the things that has also kind of happened in the past, I'm going to say two years, that may be longer, is that rather than there being one release manager, there have there has been a release team that has a senior uh, release manager there and then people who are interested in learning the process and assisting in the coordination for the release. And so that that's opened it up for people with less experience and maybe less confidence to be part of the release process as well. Uh, and now, are there any other questions? Looks like we have a few. Uh, Gina gave us the five minute warning, so uh, feel free to um, put your questions in chat. 
I just noticed on the poll that we have 40% of the uh, people here are experienced users. <laughs> so, I don't know what you all are doing in here. <laughs> I'm, I'm concerned about like actually taking the poll because I want to pick super user just because it says super, but I'm not. Let's be real. So I'm going to, I don't know. I just can't, what? I can't do it. I what? hope everyone had a good refresher. So. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you all. We got some, I'm going to try to say it, Gethulu. Is that how we're going to pronounce that in person? That Gethulu. sounds right to me. Gethulu. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for that, uh, Shula, for coming yeah, up with the new word. We're just going to invite Jason to all the sessions to, to get uh, people to come see him. Yeah. There you go. Jason Boyer turns on his webcam. <laughs> anyway. Okay. I assume super user just means you have advanced to the level where some evergreen issue has become your... Well, that was like at the very beginning. For a lot of us, <laughs> super users. For a lot of us, attach. <laughs> I can't believe you said that word. <laughs> Anyway, it said once so far, so I was I was getting nervous. I know we said Zool, but oh, I just added to the tally too. If okay. uh, there's any other questions, you can go ahead and post them in the chat, or um, you can pretty sure you could prod them uh, for other, you know, picking their brains in some of the open sessions too. So yeah, feel free yeah, to go we're, the, we're all available all over yeah. the place all the time, except for maybe Jason who is, but never mind. This is, Thanks, uh, Jason. The I'm last, sorry. I shouldn't be doing it. This is the last time I have to speak very much. So, yeah, I just float around and look at all the rooms. <laughs> well, one of the things that's cool about Hopin is you can send a direct mm -hmm. mes message to anybody that I believe uh, has the setting enabled that's in the event. I so I believe this is bullying, ma'am. Is it bullying <laughs> or is it just giving <laughs> truth? This is a feature, not a bug. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank, thank you, you everybody. So yeah. Yep. So thank you, Jason, Taryn, and Ruth very much for our refresher and also intro to Evergreen. Thanks for everybody who posted in the poll and for attending. So this was recorded um, in case if you need to watch it again or um, if you're popping in for the next section for track two, uh, this last one was recorded, you can watch it. Thank you, Gina. Yep. No problem. Thanks, Gina. You're awesome. See you all later. Bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Okay, so coming up for the next session.